Number three, this Esther anointing is an obedience anointing. Another thing that I, that's really hard for me to swallow, Esther was never really my uh, favorite story. <laughs> Esther is not my favorite story because I think I'm much more active than Esther. I, she just doesn't look active. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She's not a pioneer. I'm a pioneer. I got to go out. <laughs> like Joan the Ark sounds much more attractive to me than... <laughs> uh, anyway. So it was never really my favorite story, but, but, and, but you know, I was reading it and I thought, you know what? She was, I cannot imagine being in her place and saying yes to actually marrying a king. Oh, marrying somebody that you don't really like. I don't even know if she liked him. <laughs> That's full obedience. It just tells you that she had a very obedient heart, which is a very rare quality these days. And to me, the Lord, if you've been following me on YouTube and Facebook, you know that I do a lot of warfare. But really, I, I preach a lot about how um, victory and in intercession and victory in spiritual warfare is one thing, you, if you obey the Lord or not. It's the obe act of obedience that gives you breakthrough. Not act of crying out loud or manipulating or, you know. It's not your works, it's the obedience. In the Bible, every biblical character that was close to God and was affirmed and blessed, obeyed. What's, what's startling and amazing about this Esther is that she obeyed her uncle. Like, hey, you want to go and uh, sign up for this thing where you can possibly be a king's second wife? Not even the first wife. She had, he had Vashti. Like, I'd be really offended. No. I'm not going to be the sidekick or like the replacement wife. <laughs> replacement wife. I mean, they can, and then also, like, even if you're a wife, you're not a real wife because you can only go in when he calls you. He's like this distant husband that you don't even know. You're basically serving him. It's like old Korean days or arranged marriages. My parents just say, you marry him. Say, yes, sir, and you marry him. That's how it was in, our, in my grandma's days, you know. That is a hard thing to say yes to. But she, to me, like her story is that she was obedient. There's never in the Bible where she acted out or she run away. If I was me, I would run away <laughs> the night before. They're going to put me in the pageant. I'll run away. Pack my bags. Uncle, you're not my real dad. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I would just run away. You put me in the enemy's camp. And then they're telling you not to tell them who you, like if somebody like put white stuff on my say and say, Song, don't you ever tell them that you're Korean. Just pretend like you're white. <laughs> you're Italian. <laughs> it's a hard thing to obey. But it is, it is an anointing of obedience. Sometimes in my walk with Jesus, he stretches me so much that I have to obey him in some ridiculous things. It's like, Lord, really? You really, I mean, COVID-19 really tests your obedience. Uh, you know, Lord, you really want me to travel with two kids to these different places and where they're not inviting you? Nobody invites me. I just knock on their door and God opens it. Who during COVID-19, who will invite you to come and speak at their church? How many churches are open? None. God said, go to California. You think San Francisco people were welcoming me? No. No, like this is the worst time for you to be a traveling evangelist expecting, and, and not somebody that's not favorite. I'm not Jeremiah Johnson. I'm not Kevin Zedis. I know where I, where I stand. Nobody really knows me. They're like, song, song, huh, song. No, you mean singing a song? They're confused about my name. <laughs> that was something. So, no, my name is song, okay? And I sing a song, okay? <laughs> Like nobody, I'm, a, I'm relatively unknown, Asian woman, not very popular. So who will invite me? Nobody. So I would, I would travel the world really because I'm a missionary. The missionary is totally different. A missionary goes when God calls and there's a mission. A famous, uh, expensive speaker who's not a missionary goes when there's money. When they pay for your air flights. That's what... That's the difference. Nobody pays for my air flight to come. But I'm a missionary, so I make it happen because God told me to go. 
They, like, there's like all these famous pastors and prophets who get invited, their airfare's taken care of, and they're, they're blessed. And I'm like, you really think that's a blessing? Would you go if God told you to go to like some Indian reservation in South Dakota? I respect that pastor, man. I mean, after praying for 50 people, they'll give you $12. Thank Jesus. <laughs> Would you go there? Yeah, I'll go. Listen, I'm sort of famous in South Korea, but I don't care. I, I will not go to a Korean church even if they pay me $3,000. No, because they hate prophecy. No, I'm not going to go there. I'll go where the Lord tells me to. That's a totally different perspective. And it's, it's, it's an anointing, sometimes it's an obedience. But you know how many people are, I, I don't know that many people who are actually obedient in their actions. They want to be obedient. You sing about being obedient, you read about it. But who's actually obedient? It is hard, but I'm connecting that to the Esther anointing. How hard it would be for her to marry some weird, I'm sorry, some weird king in a different culture, a weirdo. That's hard. Sometimes my daily life for me, it feels that way. I feel like I'm in Milwaukee where there's no Asians, and here I am like oddball, and I'm, I, and I'm being mistreated. I feel I'm being mistreated, and that's something very different, difficult to explain. It's just, if you carry Jesus, you're almost always mistreated. That's just a given. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, the world hates Jesus right now, so everyone mistreats you anyway. So on my flight from um, D Washington, I was in D.C. a whole week just to try to wait. It was amazing. I flew uh, and in the airplane on this trip, I knew the devil was acting out. Uh, my kids were sitting in two seats, and I was sitting here, and a, and a white gentleman was sitting on my right side. And then he started cursing me. Because we had, and during, after COVID, like I had insults thrown at me because I was Asian. They'll blame it on any Asian. Yeah. And, See, I, and so I had my mask on, but I think we were drinking, and we're pretty free. And Delta Airlines is great. Other airlines are awful. But, like, <clears throat> my kids had masks a little, like, nose down. And I'm so tired of them having to put masks on. So we were in the airplane coming, this gentleman. We were landing. And I guess I had it off a little bit. He started cursing me, just mumbling. I call it demonic mumble. He started mumbling. I started saying, I can't believe, no, with this mask, you have to put it up above, above your nose. We're all ages. He keeps saying all ages. I'm like, oh, he's talking about my kids, right? He's blaming, like he's seeing my kids that we had it down. And he wanted it up. And then, and then he's like mumbling, you know, cursing me. So I was just like, okay, I really wanted to like get a flight attendant and fight with him and say, shut up or something. <laughs> my flesh wanted to, but I was praying I put my seatbelt out, and I, I told him, uh, but I started praying in tongues. So I pretended like I didn't speak any English, started praying in tongues to him. <laughs> so I was like, and then I started talking in Korean. I'm talking to my Korean like I was a crazy lady. We're going to go really fast, okay, guys? We're, I'm like strategizing with my kids what we're going to do with this guy. But like, I knew it was the devil. And I couldn't talk the devil out of the devil. You have to take authority. So I was just like praying in tongues. But that's just the reality that, that we are in. I mean, you guys, the devil's acting out. You might be, I mean, you're going to see more of it. We have to be prepared. And we have to be filled with the Spirit. We can't go down in that level. If I had argued with this guy, I think he might have punched me. I'm serious. That's how bad it was. And it was a fleshy temptation that I wanted to fight with him. And I was like, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take authority. <laughs> he was probably like, this woman is crazy. <laughs> what language is she speaking? I don't care. I went to Yale. It's okay. You don't need to know that. He probably went to college, community college. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, it was just not, not my level. But there are people that are not your level picking fights with you, fleshly ways to get you to act out. You just have to be filled with the spirit. We got to be some spiritual warriors. And obey the Lord. If the Lord says just ignore that person, pray and tell you, you have to do it. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Number four, this Esther anointing is a preparation and enduring anointing. I love your name of your church, Enduring Love. 
How many of you endure? So, like I said, I don't like the story of Esther because the punchline is really when she just saved her people. Before that, there's nothing. I mean, there's drama associated with her. It's like I imagine Esther just showering, <laughs> pampering, eating candy, just sitting there. You know what I mean? She doesn't really do anything. She just prepares. How many of you feel like 50 years of your life was just preparing, and you don't have the punchline yet in your life? You're like your climax has not come. You're waiting for your debut moment. It's not here. How many of you have been preparing for years and years, and you feel like God? When are you going to debut me to the world? What is my calling? When am I going to walk in it? I prophesy right now that we're starting today in Jesus' mighty name. I think the body of Christ right now, we're He's pushing you forward. I am here to tell you that November 1st is different. This is when we step into our destiny, not, not wait around. When the devil acts up and there's evil that is filling the earth, the earth needs you. You are about to come forth as sons and daughters of God. God is about to fill you up. You're going to change in Jesus' mighty name. You will walk in the fullness and the original calling that God has given you. Not the secondary calling. How many of you know, like Joseph, his original calling was this mighty governmental leader, right? But how many of you know that to get there, he had to go through all this secondary calling that confused him? He was a prisoner, prison manager. <laughs> he was a manager for prison. What kind of title is that? He was a dream interpreter, you know? So, see, for me too, like you all think I'm a prophetess. No, that's my secondary thing. I know that's not me. Just keep on thinking I'm not. It's okay. I'm just enduring through it. I don't even know what I am. The Lord says I'm an apostle, but whatever. You know, I don't even care now. <laughs> but I know I'm even greater than any of those titles. I'm a daughter of God, full of the Holy Spirit. I'm just the next revival, let me tell you. <laughs> Woo! Come on. I declare that over you. What are you? You're the next revival. Come on. Hallelujah. That's who you are. Praise Jesus. But we've endured through it. You've endured through it. It's like you went through all these things. You went through false accusations. You went through people throwing rocks at you. You had to go through these training seasons. But Esther did too. So she had this enduring anointing. And I want to encourage you that God will pay you back for every season you endure through. The fifth anointing uh, is, it's a selfless anointing. So in the war that we read, Mordecai comes and says, hey, Esther, so Hannah is going to try to kill all of us legally. How many of you were in that moment where American legal system is trying to change everything to kill you? Let's get it right. I mean, the world is trying to change. They're, they're manipulating, change the legal system, kill the churches and pastors. The reason why I'm fighting for America and the freedom of America is because I come from a family line where my, my parents, grandparents, my mom's dad was a pastor during Korean War. And, you know, they were, they were just crushed by communism. Chinese and North Koreans came down. Now they're trying to change the narrative and say that we went up. No, ridiculous. You know how people try to, try to change the historical narrative and say that the Jewish were not massacred, that kind of ridiculous stuff that the devil's doing? Well, so like my grandfather, my mom's dad, was a pastor in, during the war. The war happened on Sunday. My mom told me they, the war happened, so they were pretty close to Seoul. And uh, everyone was panicking, but my, my grandfather was preaching at a church. Which my mom ran, told him the war ha is happening. <laughs> and he said, he didn't even flicker. He said, just wait, we've got to finish this worship. He was just a real man of integrity, a real strong-willed man. But anyway, his story is that uh, when, when the North Koreans and communists came down, the first group of people that they had wanted to round up to kill were pastors, Christian pastors. Listen, if something goes wrong in America, the first target it's already is you, your pastor, me. Keeping it real. So, so the buses came to round up all the pastors to go down to Busan because that was the only place that was safe. So my grandfather went all the way down by car to Busan when the family had, were all scattered. Like the older brothers went to the army, the younger ones walked down. And my grandfather's story is that uh, when everything was just being eaten up by the communists and this little plot of land in Busan was left, 
and they were just losing the war. Um, the, the first president of South Korea, President Rhee, he, Rhee Seung Man, he wasn't a president then, but he got all the pastors together in a school hall and said, for three days, I want you to not eat, fast, and pray for me because the destiny of Korea depends on you. You need to pray for me. I'm going to take a flight to Washington, D.C., New York, or wherever. I'm going to meet with Americans in UN and ask them for desperate help to send troops. And this has to succeed. So you pray for three days. So my grandfather was there fasting and praying for three days. And because of what this president, future president Rhee did, UN came in through Incheon, and that's how we won. We, we didn't win the war. It's still during war. But that's how everything sort of flipped. 